Well, welcome to this first Sunday of the month, and tonight we have a very special guest speaker, Sir Brian Suter. And I'll say something about Brian in a moment, but we're absolutely delighted that I think for the first time, the best decision Brian's ever made, his wife Betty is with us. Welcome. And Callum, their son, great to see you. And girlfriend Caroline and brother Andrews, great to see you. Welcome, guys. We're so glad that you're all here. Brian, of course, needs no introduction to millions and millions of people. He's so well known for lots of things. Apparently, at an early age, Brian became very passionate about buses. His dad was a bus driver. I'm told that at one point in his life, he trained to become a commerce teacher. Is that right? And then became a CA with Arthur Anderson. And it looks like everything changed in 1980 when he and his sister and her husband started Stagecoach, which is a very famous bus company in this country. And today they've been running Stagecoach, Megabus, Southwest Trains. Their investments include Alexander Dennis, and everything else from perfume to pets, with a pet company in Romania, I discovered this last week. Don't know how you got into that, but I'm sure it must be a great investment. And uh, Brian has become an in, a hugely significant business influence in Scotland and globally in the world. Alongside their business interests, they run Suta, the Suta Foundation, the Suta Trust, and just over this last three years alone, they've given away 32 million pounds to great causes. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Betty, I think, runs that trust and looks after the things that go on there. But you know, we have a real life story with experience from that trust. Several years ago, one of my closest friends, Peter Pretorius, who died this last year and went to be with the Lord, turned up at my house, and Peter and his wife Anne and their family and their team run an organization called JAM, Joint Aid Management. And he turned up on a visit from South Africa, and he was deeply distraught in that it was, it was just in the middle of that recent recession, right bang in the middle of that recession. And several of his sponsors and supporters through no fault of their own, were just unable to fulfill their pledges and their promises. And the outcome was that 120,000 kids were going to die. They feed 1.4 million children a day. And the missing funds was going to immediately impact. So we talked and I said, well, if I had that finance, I said, how much do you need? He said, I need urgently a million and a half. I said, if I had it, I would give it to you. But I know somebody who might. And it just so happened that Brian was around and we met. And within a few days, the Suter Trust gave them all that funds and 120,000 lives were saved. Isn't that amazing? What blessed me was not only their generosity to help in that need, but the speed with which they gave it, because it couldn't take weeks and months for committee meetings. These kids were dying. And alongside the joint aid management, they run Jesus Alive Ministries, and Peter died suddenly last year, last August. But they'd been running an evangelistic endeavor alongside the feeding program, and more than 12 million decisions were recorded for Jesus through that ministry and his lifetime. Isn't that amazing? So, Brian's a massive, big businessman, but look at the difference in the lives that he's making elsewhere. He's won multiple awards, Businessman of the Year, Scottish Business Achievements Award, the Scottish Entrepreneurs Award, honorary degrees from Strathclyde and Abate University. And the companies that he's run have also won significant awards, including UK Bus Operator of the Year. And Stagecoach, at one point, was nominated the most admired company in the world by management today. 
And so we just thank you, Brian, for being able to come this evening, be with us. We thank God for you and all that you're doing. Sometimes Brian's quoted controversy. The first time I ever met Brian, you probably won't remember this, but he was fighting Clause 28. And uh, we met in a meeting somewhere. Um, Clause 28, of course, was an act that was being repealed concerning the teaching of homosexuality in schools. And he, he drew a lot of opposition for that period. He financed a referendum. And it seems like over 1.2 million people responded in that referendum. And 86% of the people who responded agreed with him. In fact, he had more votes than any political party at any time in Scottish history. So who wants Sir Brian as our next First Minister? <laughs> that would be really, really interesting. He also drew controversy at one time when he was paid a 1.6 million pound bonus by Stagecoach. People thought that was excessive, but it turns out he gave out he gave 900,000 pounds of it to the trust and the rest of it to the pension fund. And so we have a guy here who's not only good at what he's doing, but he believes in what he says. He's a family man. He loves God passionately, believes in the local church. He and Betty run a small group, a community group, a growth group, we call them here, helping people take steps forward in their walk with God. And I know that you are going to be blessed by what he has to share and to say. So, ladies and gentlemen, guys watching, let's welcome Surprise Suit as he comes and shares with us this evening. Well, Andrew, thank you for that amazing introduction. <laughs> I think I'll have to take you with me everywhere I go. <laughs> Uh, but it is good to have my wife here tonight, and a welcome to all those that are watching on the screen and other places, but uh, my wife's from Glasgow, and uh, all that stuff about, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we have a simple arrangement uh, with the charitable trust. I, I make the money, and she gives it all away, so it works really, really well. Um, the other thing, of course, is that, you know, I, you know, Glasgow is a great city, and um, we got married in Glasgow. And I remember when, when we got, well, when she got married, she came down the, the close. You all know what a close is, don't you? And our neighbor was hanging out the window, and she's shouting, Don't do it, Betty. It's, it's no too late. <laughs> but she went against our neighbor's advice. And we got our pictures taken at Park Heed outside the church, and we're really pleased with ourselves in the picture. I was particularly pleased with myself, <laughs> having got Betty to marry me. But um, behind us, I think, was the social work department. And when the pictures came back, we stood there grinning, and there's a great big gang slogan on the wall behind us that said, Tongs ya bass. <laughs> so, all right. Our wedding pictures are just amazing. <clears throat> anyway, Andrew, Andrew gave me a letter and he said, I want you to speak about the power of one. And uh, I got really excited at that point, actually, um, because contrary to what you may think, and, and Andrew's really an original thinker and he's had some great ideas, but someone else had the idea before you. And the reason I know that is for a full year, I was the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. Now, I know that's not exciting anyone. And as I say that, I can see you all turning off, right? But you know, I've done some pretty mediocre things in my life. And you said I was qualified to be a commerce teacher. That is true, actually. I took a night class in the College of Commerce, and the first time I taught accountancy, which I only did for a very short space of time, I said, now, is there any questions? And it was like, you know, people that were bank clerks and office workers were trying to, you know, get a qualification or whatever. So this lassie in the front put her hand up. I said, yes. She said, I don't understand that. I said, 
Which part do you not understand? She says, I don't understand any of that. <laughs> so that's why I'm not a teacher and I'm a businessman because I was absolutely hopeless at teaching. Anyway, the, the Institute of Chartered Accountants use the power of one as their slogan for their ethics program. And I spent a year going around the world talking about the power of one. So I felt this was an int I felt there's some sort of other hand in this that I'm getting the opportunity to talk about it tonight. And this is what we went around saying. This is what the power of one was about at the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Personal responsibility, ethical leadership, moral courage, you know. And then they kind of remind us, a well-earned reputation can be lost in a very short space of time. Yes, well, we all know that. And then it says, ICAS recognizes the power of every individual CA, the power of one to influence those around them. And really, what they were saying was, each individual accountant has got ethical accountability and moral accountability. And that was a great message. The problem is we didn't explain that to anybody at all. We just said, this is what you've got to do. So it was left to every individual to work out what that ethical framework should be. But it was interesting to talk about that and do that for a year. So this comes to the question then, what, what is the power of one person? You know, is, what power can one person really, really, really influence? You know, can one person make a difference? Now, hands up if you've heard of Oscar Schindler. Yeah, a few of you are old enough to have watched black and white movies. Um, how many of you have heard about Irina Sendler? Ah, one person, two people. Okay, watch this wee clip about Irina Sendler. For five years during the Second World War, a group of young Polish women, some barely out of their teens, outfoxed the Nazis. They saved the lives of thousands of Jewish children, smuggling them out of the Warsaw Ghetto to safety. Any Jew that was caught with a non-Jew, the non-Jew's family and himself were killed on spot. The first question is, After the war, instead of being honored as heroines, these women were silenced by the communist authorities. Now their story can be told. I sit here as a testament to those people who were committed to, to, saving, to saving a Jewish child's life. Quite moving, isn't it? You really need to watch the movie. Most of you probably haven't seen it. The movie was made in 2006, and she actually speaks at the end of the movie because she's still alive then. She died in 2008. Can one person make a difference? The power of one person. Imagine if there had been 100 Irina Sendlers. There could have been 250,000 children saved. If there had been 1,000 Irina Sendlers, 2.5 million lives might have been saved. If there had been a million Irina Sendlers, 
that had the moral courage to do what was right, could they have perpetrated such a heinous crime? Yeah, there is power in one person. One person can make a difference. And I'm sure you've all heard the starfish philosophy story before, but I need to remind you, it's the best example. The tide comes in, the starfish are lying all over the beach, the wee boy's picking them up, he's throwing them back in the water one at a time. A man comes along, he says, what are you doing? He says, I'm throwing them back in the water. The guy says, Tim, look at them. There's thousands and thousands of them. What difference can you make? And the wee boy picks up the one at his feet and he throws it in the water and he said, it made a difference to that one. And that's how we change the world. It starts with the power of one person. Just that there's a problem with the power of one person, <laughs> actually. And the key to that is in the last word, person. Because persons, that's you and me, we have frailties and we have shortcomings. Just in August there, my, my daughter had identical twins, which was very exciting. And uh, so we went down to London to help. And um, she has two Pomeranians. And uh, my wife gave me a pair of pink shorts. She did remind me they were really for the beach. But anyway, I was up the park with the Pomeranians and my shorts, because that's what, what you do when you're a man. You know, you get to take the dogs and make the dinners, right? Not much else, you know? Anyway, after getting a few looks in the park with my Pomeranians and my shorts, I was wandering back down, and I passed this building, and I thought, I've been here before. And it came flooding back to me. It was Imperial College in London that I was passing. And I remember this maybe be about 10 or 12 years ago, that I was invited to a dinner there with Og Sang Su Kai. Do you remember her? She was a prisoner in Burma. She was, you know, a civil rights campaigner. She fought for democracy. And, and it was a great privilege to be there and, and to hear her, you know. And I knew I wasn't there because of sex appeal and personality, but... I knew I was going to have to write a ticket for the children's hospital at the end of the meeting, but that was fine. It was a privilege to be there. And I, I think in, I was quite in awe of her in some ways. And I thought, is this going to be the next Nelson Mandela? You know, what a privilege to get some time with this woman. You can imagine how disappointed I have been when we see this Nobel Prize winner now in a position of power and authority, and yet we see the Rohingya genocide going on in Burma. And you're thinking, why is she not doing something about it? Now, maybe, she, maybe she, I don't know enough about it. Maybe she's, you know, the military are, take, are running the country and she can't influence it. But, you know, I had a great sense of disappointment. A great sense of disappointment. Have you ever been really disappointed with someone that you really held in high regard? A few people nodding in the room for that. You know, I met Alex Salmon at the airport a few months ago, you know, and I know him quite well, and I like Alec. We're, I'm not a fair-weather friend, and we're in a, a good chat about things. Now, I can't tell you whether this is right, or, or I, I hope he gets justice, and I hope his alleged victims get justice too. I can't say anything about that. But I, I would say this to you. I was disappointed, just that there's a situation at all, you know. And you know, there's some people here tonight and you've been disappointed with your church leaders. I'm sure that's not in destiny. I can sense here that your church leaders don't disappoint you. But, but let's be honest, some of us have been around the block a few times and we've got a lot of bruises and sometimes we've been disappointed in our church leadership. Church leaders can disappoint. Sometimes we're disappointed in our families. You know, a parent that hasn't lived up to her expectation, a rebellious child, a difficult sibling. Some of us have had disappointments with our friends. You know, the truth of it, we're getting closer to home. All of us have had disappointments in ourselves. That's the truth of it. We've felt disappointment. We've been disappointed at things we've said. We've been disappointed at things we've done. We've been disappointed with our repetitive failures. And that's the problem with the power of one person. 
is that we have the capability to inspire like Arena Sandler, but we also have the capability to disappoint and to be destructive sometimes as well. And so the power of one person is not really enough for us. And that brings me on to my second point. We need a power greater than ourselves from outside of what we are. And so we look at the power of one prophet. Yeah, and I think you know who that prophet I'm talking about is. Now, there's been many prophets been sent before Jesus. There was Moses, and Moses had special powers. He was able to separate the, dead, the, the Red Sea, and he was able to cast all sorts of, of um, plagues on the Egyptians. He had, he had amazing special powers, actually. And then, and then there was other prophets who could bring down fire from heaven, people like uh, Elijah. And then there was Jonah that we, we presume was in a whale for three days and, and survived. And we think, these guys really had amazing powers. But then God decides that he needs to do something even more. And so he sends a really special prophet. Because this isn't just a prophet. This is Jesus Christ, his own son. And so he sends him to earth. Now, we like the idea of special powers, don't we? I mean, I mean we have, there's all these movies with, this, with all these guys that we go to the movies to watch, you know, because we, we think that it's great when humans have got special powers, you know? So we've got, we've got people that can climb walls and people with super strength and people that can fly and, you know, we've got, we, gender balance isn't great, but we've got Wonder Woman and, you know, and, and so it goes on, right? And, um, but, but we like watching these things because it would be, we think, wouldn't it be great if we, if we could do these things? I don't know. I have a recurrent dream that I can fly, you know? Some people have that, you know? And it's a great feeling, you know? I haven't had it for a long time. I wish it would come back, actually. But anyway, it's, you know, and, 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 and then it's all right until you stop flying, then you're falling, you know? But, but you know, the interesting thing about the special powers that Jesus had was they were really different from any powers that anyone's ever had before. And a lot of the Old Testament prophets, their special powers were to do with places and things, sometimes to do with people. But all of Jesus' special powers were used for people. Even the making the water into wine, it was for the people, right? And it was necessary for the people that were there. And so Jesus Christ appears in the center of history, and comes with these amazing powers. I'd like us to read one of his stories together at this time. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's stand together and read it together. Will we do that? Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give you my half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. Please be seated. Now, I, I do love this story. And um, maybe it's because there's a wee man in the story. And uh, so I kind of identify with it. Then, of course, it goes on. It was a wealthy wee man. And then... <laughs> 
he, he liked making money, and we're going to think, okay, and, and he didn't like keeping rules. And I'm thinking, yeah, I, I know who this person is, yes, I can identify with this person. Um, and uh, a few weeks ago, we had stagecoach AGM, and I had to turn back to go to the toilet and past these two wee women from Glasgow and heard one saying to the other, there goes wee Brian Suter, living proof that Snow White and Dopey had a child. <laughs> so we all know about the wee man syndrome in Glasgow, don't we? Um, that we men can be really vicious, horrible wee people. We know that, right? I, I once had this group of bankers and they wanted to walk the job and, and they said, I said, well, we've just started the depot in Glasgow. Why don't you come to Glasgow? They said, right, we'll come up to Glasgow. And uh, so they came to Glasgow and the BMW arrived for them and they got in the car and they said, and where are you going to take us first, Brian? I said, well, I'm going to show you the magic bus route in Easter House. So, we, we, we just come up off the motorway and we just turned into Westerhouse Road and one of the wee men come running out our close and threw a brick at the car. <laughs> and I'm so, for those that are in India, I have to, someone will have to interpret this one for you, right? But we have this reputation in Glasgow about these wee people and uh, I mean, I had the heat stuck in me by a wee person. The only thing was that he didn't work out that I was also a wee person. And so, wee men sticking the heat works when you stick the heat in a big man's face because your head lands on their nose, but his head just went straight to my head, right? And he, he passed out, which was, which was good because I wasn't about to be, you know, where I lived in Glasgow, you either had to be a good fighter or a good runner, and I was a good runner, right? So... Well, it's enough to be said about the wee people of Glasgow. Anyway, we, we pay tribute to them. <laughs> In fact, we're, we're very careful about them. I mean, don't forget, some of the worst people in history were very small. Napoleon was a small man. Attila the Hun was only four feet ten, despite the fact he was played by Arnold Schwarzenegger when they made the movie. <laughs> but <laughs> Jesus did a number of things for Zacchaeus. And I have another theory about Zacchaeus being up the tree. I think he was up the tree for his safety. Because can you imagine the crowd? There's we Zacchaeus. We'll get him now, you know. He's taken enough money off us. I'm going to get him now, right? He was safer up the tree. But Jesus knew he was up the tree. And we read the story together, right? He did a number of things for him. The first thing he did for him was a freedom from his past. Zacchaeus had a terrible past. Everybody hated him, right? And Zacchaeus needed forgiveness. You see, Jesus has a special power. He can forgive you. And he can forgive you of everything you've ever done. No other person in the universe has the power to do that but Jesus Christ. But the great thing about Jesus is he doesn't only forgive you for your past, but he has the power to free you from your past. And some of you are still carrying that burden, but Christ can free you from your past. And you can live in freedom and release from what you've done. Now, when I was doing this talk about the power of one, okay, I had a, thought I'd got a really great ending to my talk. And so what I used to do was, I had a JFK quote, and it said this, our task is not to fix the blame for the past, but to fix the course for the future. Now, it's a pretty powerful saying, because in politics, in business, in every walk of life, in families, we're always looking for somebody to blame. Eh? It's human nature to look for somebody to blame, right? And he's saying, we're not trying to fix the blame for the past. We're looking forward to the future. And you know, for a secular agenda, I really endorse that as a good way to go forward. But I'm going to tell you something. Somebody needs to fix the past. You can't forget the past. And Jesus Christ is the only person that can fix your past for you.
The second special power that he demonstrated to Zacchaeus was he gave him power for the present. Because Zacchaeus needed to have a transformation in his life. And that visit of Jesus to his house, by the way, everybody else is saying, what is Jesus doing? Does he know who he's going to, going to have tea with, you know? Uh, can you imagine, you know, the stigma? What, you know? But after this visit, Zacchaeus' life was completely transformed. Zacchaeus turned from being a horrible wee man to being the most generous person in the village. He gave half his goods away to the poor. People that he robbed, he paid them back four times over. He must have been some businessman, by the way. Because he must have made eight times the rate of return to be able to four times the rate of return. But anyway, I do have a certain admiration for him. But he gave Zacchaeus the power to live a new life in the present. And the final thing he gave him it gave him hope for his future because it gave him a fresh start. If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. And that was Zacchaeus' experience that day. Now here's someone saying, well, Brian, that, that's amazing. And it is amazing, actually, what, what happened to Zacchaeus. But how can that happen? And that's explained in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, where it says this. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You see, this is supernatural. The power of the presence of Christ working within you changes your desire so you want to do the right thing which isn't natural. And it gives you the power to live a transformed life. That's the kernel of the gospel, folks. If you don't get anything else tonight, take that away with you. And I wonder if you're here tonight and you say, well, Brian, this sounds like I could really do with this in my life. Let me tell you, if you don't know Jesus in that powerful, transformational way, then you can find him. Because Jesus wants to be part of your life. He wants to be in you. He wants to be with you. And Jesus Christ is for you tonight, friend. And if you're here and you don't have that experience in your own life, in a simple prayer, you can accept Jesus Christ and know that forgiveness for your past. Know that power to face the present and go out that door with the greatest hope for the future. You see, there's the power of one, but then there's the power of the one, which is Jesus Christ. And here's the unique thing. When you find the power of that special prophet that God sent, right? The power of your life is much greater than if you were on your own. Life with Jesus Christ, amazing things can happen. And if you want some examples of this, look at the disciples. They turned the world upside down. William Wilberforce, the guy that led the abolition of slavery, that's what motivated him, Jesus Christ. Martin Luther King, civil rights movement, motivated by Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, who started the revolution, the, the Reformation, motivated by Jesus Christ. In 1825, in Glasgow here, the presbytery decided they were going to have an evangelical campaign. And so they decided they would run meetings for two weeks, they would have all sorts of special speakers and they would invite all the people and all the churches would join together for this great event. It was a complete disaster. In fact, it was such a disaster, at the end of it, they decided to get all the church leaders together and they said, well, look, this is the assessment on this. We spent all this money, we had all these preachers, we had all these people came but do you know that over the two-week period, 
only one 12 year old boy responded to the gospel. His name was David Livingston. Don't be discouraged, church. Sometimes we can become discouraged, but God is at work. He knows what he's doing. And this boy was a 12-year-old boy working as a mill, a boy in a mill, who then went to Africa and led the abolition of slavery. Here he is with the Arab slave traders. That's one of the reasons why he's revered in Africa, not only because he brought the gospel, but because he brought freedom. And these two should always be associated. For we find true freedom in Jesus Christ. Well, we've got the power of one person. We've got the power of one special prophet with special powers, Jesus Christ, God's Son. Let's think a wee bit about the power of one people. There is something about people acting together that's special. It's like the starfish story. It really works because somebody else sees the laddie throwing the starfish and they bend down and they start throwing them as well, you know? It's like, it's like the fight against segregation. You know, it started with one woman not being prepared to move her seat in the bus and, and, and then it becomes a people movement. So it becomes from one person to the power of one people. And that's how revolutions start. Gandhi's civil disobedience, the apartheid, overturning apartheid in Africa. It started with one person and then it became a people movement. And if the church is anything, it's a people movement. And God's power is at work in his people. Do you believe that, folks? I believe that. I really do. Now, when we use the word power, we don't automatically associate it with the church. We should, right? You know, I turned my television on the other week and there's this big council at the Vatican and I'm not seeing much power. I'm seeing a lot of pomp. I'm seeing a lot of ceremony and I love the current Pope. I think he's a great guy. I think he's doing a fantastic job and, and really trying circumstances. We should pray for the man. Honestly, we should, right? But I have to tell you folks, if I went to the Angl Anglican Synod or I went to an evangelical get-together some of the places winning much better than the Vatican one, right? And the, and the word power isn't what we associate with these gatherings. But that's, that's no right. There's something fundamentally wrong here. Because God's people should be the most powerful people on earth. Do you know that the word power is mentioned 114 times in the New Testament? And most or half of these times, it's associated with the church. It's associated with God's people. Why are we not experiencing power in the church? Why are we not having the effect that the power of one people should have? We should be a conduit for God's power. Hands up if you understand the digital age. Oh, that's good because we've got a lot of young people here. I need to speak to you afterwards and you can explain it to me. <laughs> anyway, I used to be invested in a company called Skyscanner. Have you heard about Skyscanner? It's a great company. We put 120,000 pounds in and we've got six million back. That's how we can afford to feed these children. The Lord bless us what we do sometimes. Right? It was a very pleasurable experience. Anyway, the, the, not all of our eggs are double yokers, right? For every one like that, we've got a couple that we really mess up, okay? But after we did the sky scanner deal, I said to the guy that runs it, would you sit me down and explain what this digital stuff's about? Because didn't he really understand it? And I really like to understand it a wee bit. And so he sat me down and he put this chart in front of me. This, this is an interesting chart. Along the bottom is frequency, and up the side is universality, okay? We'll start with universality. My Ferrari is the bottom left-hand corner, okay? Because you're not going to need that often, right? Most people are not buying a lot of Ferraris, right? So my Ferrari does not happen very often. 
Whereas at the top of that university, universality, my funeral is absolutely universal, apart from those that have been resurrected, right? Okay. But short of the Lord coming back, or you've been resurrected, which we're all looking forward to, praise God. But apart from that, you're going to need my funeral at some point, okay? And then along the bottom is frequency. So how often does it happen? Hopefully my funeral is only once in a lifetime. And, and then as you come along, there's all these other companies. You see, Skyscanner's a web stock. It sits in the middle with Amazon. Amazon then wants to become a tech stock. Actually, since he did this graph, it's become a tech stock, really, right? And everyone's moving up in this bit at the top. And you see Google's at the very top of this, right? Because it's happening all the time. So I hope you're knowing it just now and you're listening to me, especially on those that are in this listening because we can't even see you. So get off your phones and pay attention, okay? So I said, okay, I understand that. And the companies up the top, three of these companies are worth a trillion dollars a piece, right? Unfortunately, my company's doing in this bottom bit. <laughs> it's not worth anything like that now, okay? We're just simply employing people and producing things. That apparently has no value any longer, okay? So anyway, I said to him, okay, I understand that. I said, what other thing do you need to tell me as well as understanding this graph? He said, it's this, Brian. He said, what you have to be is the point of discovery for whatever it is you're trying to sell or you're trying to do. So with Skyscanner, you need to be the point of discovery for people that are going on an airplane and want to make a trip. And you've got to be better than kayak or whatever, right? And you've got to be there, right? Why is Google doing so well? Because it's the point of discovery for everything at the moment, right? Not everything, almost everything. And here's my point about this. The church can't learn much from business, right? But I think we can learn some from this. We need to be the point of discovery for Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, we are right at the top of the universality because everyone needs Jesus. And we are right at the top of the frequency because we need them every minute. Why, church, are we not being the point of discovery that we need to be? The point of discovery for forgiveness. The point of discovery for freedom. The point of discovery for healing. The point of discovery for, for, for meaning. The point of discovery for eternal life. Nobody else has this package, guys. We need to raise our game in the church. The best way to do this is to demonstrate God's power. And the people of God need to be demonstrating God's power. Why is that not happening? Now, you're probably working this out. I, none of my talk is original. I just plagiarize everything from other people. And I have to say that that's the best way to learn unless you're off a brainy and you can work things out for yourself. So I'm a bit of a parasite, really. I just feed on other people's brains, you know. So this next diagram is from Equippers in New Zealand, right? And this is about the church. And this explains the power vacuum in the church. And it's interesting. Because what it says is, we've got supernatural, otherworldly activity. What goes on in the heavens beyond us. A lot of it we don't understand until we get there, right? But there's supernatural, otherworldly stuff going on in our world, right? Around us. And then there's supernatural, this world, right? So the supernatural should not be limited to the other world. The supernatural needs to be manifest in this world, right? And then down the bottom, we've got natural, this worldly. And the reason why the church is not experiencing power is that we dwell in the natural, this worldly part. 
and we're not drawn up into the supernatural of this world. And that's the reason why we're not seeing God moving in the way that he wants to move in our churches today. Now, I'm not, I, I, I have to be really clear about this, right? You know, we're all in different traditions, right? It doesn't matter. What we need is the power of God at work in the church, right? And what we need to do is we need to see the supernatural this worldly. We need to be on the right-hand side of this diagram and not on the left-hand side of the diagram, right? Now, I can hear somebody saying, well, Brian, did you just make this up? Okay. Well, I didn't. Here's some verses for you to go along with this. And the first verse, I've got, I've got three verses together here just coming up. Acts chapter 1. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. And finally, I love this verse, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. And I have to tell you folks, there is a theology out there that says that this age of miracles and the supernatural was only for 30 years after Jesus was on earth. That is false theology. It doesn't say that in my Bible, right? And I tell you, we need to be open to this. Whatever church you're from, whatever denomination you're in, you need to be open to the movement of the Holy Spirit. And I want to say this personally, I don't want to be an impediment to that. I want to be part of it wherever I am. And I'm sure you want to be part of it too. So, we should see a vibrant and powerful church. I'm going to go fast. There are three, three attributes of a vibrant and powerful church. And this is what they are. The first thing a powerful church will do, it will clarify the message. There are three parts of the Christian faith. There are rules, which we need. There's a role model in Jesus Christ. At that point, we're the same as every other religion, because every religion has got rules and role models. And then we've got a redeemer, Jesus Christ, and that's where we're different, because he is all-powerful. He has the special powers that I talked about earlier on, right? And that's what's unique about the Christian message, right? And that's got to be central to what we're doing. I was in Poland Christmas past, one before that. I went for lunch with the people, lovely people, most, nearly all practicing Catholics. I said, what does your Christmas involve? I'm telling them about what we're going to do. And they said, well, on Christmas Day, this is what we do. We gather around the table and we have a chair. And the chair's an empty chair. I said, that's interesting. What's that for? They said, well, the empty chair is there so that if there's a poor person or a needy person or someone, a neighbor or someone that is alone, is that we invite them into that chair. I got really excited about this theology. You know, that's fantastic. That's what Jesus said. As much as you did it to the least one of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So this chair at the table at the Polish Christmas dinner is Jesus' chair. So I said to the lassie, when was the last time someone was in the chair? Oh, she said, 35 years ago. I have to tell you folks, that's a sad picture of the European church. We some got great inheritance, we've got some great legacy, we've got some super theology, we've got some great rituals that are really meaningful and reflect that theology. But let me tell you something. The chair's been empty for a long time. We need to have the resurrected Jesus right at the center of our message. Now, I don't understand why we do this, but for a number of centuries, we've not been getting this right. There's these different components of the Christian message. Let's say, you know, I had a baker's shop, right? And I've got all sorts of cupcakes and cream cakes, and all that good stuff, millionaire shortcake, and all the rest of it, right? Why would I not put it in the window? 
And you know what we do in the church? We fill the window with bread rolls. We put all the rules in the window. We say, you have to do this before you can come in here, you know. We've got it the wrong way around. We need to put a redeemer in the window. The second thing a powerful church will do, it will connect before you correct. Look at the story again. He went to him. Do you notice that? Jesus Jesus went to Zacchaeus. He could could have said, there's an invitation to come and hear me speaking. But he didn't. He said, I'm coming to your house. Right? House, sorry for those that are watching in other places. Okay. I'm coming to your house. Right? And so he went to him. Right? He engaged with him. He had a meal with him. Despite the fact he was the most disguised, despised guy in the village. You see, he connected before he corrected. He could have shouted up in the tree, you scurrilous little rascal, you should give everyone their money back, right? And everybody would have cheered for Jesus. They all thought he was great, right? But he didn't. He connected with Zacchaeus. And then the corrected behavior came. Then Zacchaeus gave half of his wealth away. Then Zacchaeus repaid everyone that he'd robbed from. And there's shades of alpha here, isn't there? We have to connect with people first. Why is alpha so successful? Two reasons. First of all, we connect with people. And secondly, the Holy Spirit is blessing it and has ordained it. And that's why it's successful. And the third thing we need to do is we need to create compassionate communities. This is a way to reach the millennial generation. Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, so busy, so much to live with, so little to live for. Lonely, drifting, purposeless, suicides and self-harming at epidemic proportions. Create compassionate communities where people know they're really cared and loved. John Wesley said this, Light yourself with passion. People will come for miles to watch you burn. And that's what we need in the church. Because when we've got power, we'll have passion. Psalm 68, verse 35 says this, Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. I'm through, folks. My my final slide here, just to sum up. The power of one person, you have power. God gave you the right to choose. You can choose to inspire and do good things. You can choose to go your own way. But the best choice you could make is to choose that special person, Jesus, and invite him into your life. The two of you together, you're going to be an awesome team. I love that, Sam. I just want to be in a church like that. That's awesome. And that the power of God is there with the people. It's just awesome. And for those of you here that are Christians, the power of one people, what a prospect. What a tremendous opportunity. Folks, I really want to be part of that. I hope you do too. I'm going to ask Andrew to come back about this time. Come on, let's cheer for Brian again. See, just while our musicians are coming back up to help us wrap up tonight's meeting, what so many things to think about. And it's highly likely, as Brian was sharing and communicating those things, something in that message is still sticking in your heart. It's just ringing in your head. 
It's, it's stirring something within you. And you know, God, God is real. And he wants to have real encounters with people. And as we wrap up tonight, even before we just sing this song, cafe is open, we can have coffee in a moment, enjoy some friendship together. But you know, your life could change forever tonight. It could change forever tonight. Why don't we just pray a moment? Would you close your eyes with me? Just bow your head a second. I would like to take this opportunity to pray for two kinds of people here. You know, it's Sunday, and it's usually Sunday. Christians go to church, right? But it's possible tonight that you don't have a real relationship with God. Maybe, maybe you've been going to church all your life, but you don't know him. Maybe you've only got a, caught the first part of that what you think is a Christian message, there's rules and you've got to keep them. Here's, here's the truth. None of us can. None of us can. And then we get all down and depressed because we're constantly failing on the inside. But there is a God in heaven who saw that condition we were in and decided out of the love in his heart he would resolve it. And he did send his son Jesus who came and died on a cross instead of you and me. He was the only one. He had another special power. He was sinless. He never put a foot wrong. Audibly twice the voice of God was heard. This is my beloved son. I'm so pleased with him. And this Jesus died for you and for me. Great name says he rose from the dead and he's alive today to give us life. And maybe, maybe you're sitting here today, or you're watching or you're connecting with us from somewhere else this evening and you're not at all sure of that relationship with God. You can be. You know, God has done everything necessary. There's nothing left to be done for you to come into his family. All that remains is for you to say you want to. For you to accept what he's already given. And maybe you consider yourself as a Christian, but you don't really know God. Maybe you're an agnostic, you don't really know. Very rarely find atheists these days. But the Bible teaches us that we can taste and see that God is good. Maybe you're sitting here tonight or watching with us, and in your heart of hearts, you want the kind of life that Brian was talking about. You want to know what it is to be forgiven, and especially to have a new beginning where the past is not pointing fingers at you. And you know what? He gives us the power to live different. What we couldn't do for ourselves, he works within us, and he produces the change. We just let him in, that's all. And in the event there's somebody here tonight, maybe you've come on your own, maybe you've come with someone, maybe somebody invited you, maybe you're just watching in somebody's home, maybe you're with a, a church somewhere tonight watching on live stream. But you know God is speaking to you. It's a simple thing, but it's such a profound thing. When you step into a relationship with God, and do you know what I'd like to do? I'd, I'd like to pray for you. And this is, this is what I'd like us to do. In the room here, would you, would you catch hands with someone beside you? Even if there's an aisle, stretch across the aisle. Maybe you're watching somewhere tonight, you've got somebody around you, hold hands together. A lot of lonely people in the world. It's great when we can touch one another, we've got family and friendship together. And you know what? I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you're sitting here or watching tonight and you are saying in your heart, I really need to know Jesus. I really need to give my life to him. I, I, I really need to step into this relationship I've heard about. There's an emptiness in my soul that needs to be filled and that emptiness is God-shaped. I'm going to pray a prayer. And if it's the desire of your heart to have this relationship with God, why don't you borrow my words 
and pray this prayer. You're borrowing my words, but it's the cry of your heart. So just while we're connecting with each other and with family together and friends together, if you need to know Jesus tonight, pray this prayer with me. You can pray it out loud if you like, but you don't have to. Just pray it in the quietness of your own heart. Ready? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that you love me so much that you sent Jesus to die for me. Tonight, I want to receive your forgiveness. I want you to come into my heart, into my life. I give my life to you. I thank you that when I pray like this, you promised you'd receive me. Jesus, I need you tonight to fill the void in my soul, to put that power inside me that change can happen. I'm telling you, I need you. Would you come into my life? I want to thank you that you've opened the door for me and that you're receiving me into your family right now. Thank you that you promised you'd never leave me. Teach me to hear your voice. Teach me to know your ways. And would you be my Lord and my Savior from this day forward? Amen. Now listen, don't let go of people's hands just yet. If you're in the room and you prayed that prayer, and you meant it. Do you know what I'd like you to do? I'd like you to squeeze the hand you're holding. Go on, squeeze that hand. Maybe you're squeezing each other's hands. If you're in a home or in a church somewhere, maybe even you're on your own tonight. You just tuned in on your own. God's still there with you. But see, when you squeeze somebody's hand, somebody knows that you prayed that prayer. And during this week, they're going to remember that. And they're going to pray for you. And listen, just to be sure that it wasn't a, a twitch, squeeze that hand again. God, squeeze that hand again. Amen. Now you can give God a big round of applause. Yeah. Wow. So, here's the question in this room. I can't see the guys who are live streaming, but you can connect with us on the chat and social media. There's people there just to help you with that. But if you're in this room tonight, and listen, here's the question. If your hand just got squeezed, right? Your hand got squeezed by somebody. Give me a wave. Look at that, all over the place. So, just to be sure. If your hand got squeezed, give me a wave again. All over the place. Isn't that fantastic? Now, we'd like to pray for you as well as the person whose hands you just squeezed. So, as we wrap up tonight, listen, if your hand just got squeezed, would you do me a favor? Would you get a hold of that person and bring them with you to the front here? We'd like to give them a present, pray for them personally, and encourage them forward. Maybe they squeezed your hand and you didn't pray the prayer yourself. That's okay. Bring them forward anyway and we can have a chat. But God is in this house. Isn't that amazing? People coming to know Jesus tonight. Ah, oh, they're coming forward already. Come on and catch, catch the hand of that person. Bring them forward with you. If your hand got squeezed, catch the hand of that person and bring them forward. Come on. Come on, let's hear it for these guys as they come. There's somebody in the middle here, somebody in the back there. Come on, don't be shy. We love you. Come on, let's just keep hearing it for these guys. Come on, there's some more to come yet. Yeah. This is the biggest moment of your life. Isn't that fantastic? They're all beaming down here. 
shining. God is good. So a few more folks yet to come. You take your time. I did say there were two prayers that we wanted to pray, right? This was the first one. The second prayer is this. That was such a great message tonight about power. And do you know what? There was an occasion when John, this is John the Baptist, pointed at Jesus and he said, I'm baptizing you with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was risen from the dead. He's alive today. And guess what? He's still filling people with the Holy Spirit. Supernatural things happen, like speaking in tongues and new gifts and boldness on the inside. And so, if you need to respond to that message tonight, is I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray for these guys, make some space, and then we're going to pray for you guys. And let me just tell you this. I became a Christian, right, in Wales. And it was all rules and regulations. The people loved me. That's why I stuck at it. They just loved me. But I got really bored with my Christian life. Almost quit. And then somebody said, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It'll change everything. And I had discussions, and I met with this guy, and he said, no, 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 that died out in the early church. That's not for today. And then I met another guy and said, no, no, it is for today, but it's for special people. Got to be holy. And the last thing I was, was holy, right? <laughs> and so I didn't think it was for me. Then I read something in the book of Acts. It says, this promise is for you, for your children, for your children's children, and for every last person that the Lord calls. So it's not about waiting until you're perfect. You don't have to go and live in a monastery for a month. It's just saying, Jesus, I need this power. And he will fill you full. So we're going to take a moment to pray for these guys who come to know Jesus tonight. And then after we've sung a song, the music quietened down a bit. If you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost, you come forward and we'll be delighted to pray for you. Come on, let's hear it for Sir Brian Suter again. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. And, hey, God heals people, right? So if you are sick tonight, don't go out with that sickness. God wants to heal you in this place. There's somebody in this room tonight. You have a problem with the forearm of your right arm, just in this area here. It's given you pain and trouble. I don't know exactly what the issue is, but God wants to heal you today. Is that you? Oh, that is you. Well, I guess we better pray for you right away then. What's, what's wrong with your arm? Pins and needles all the way through it. And it gives you some pain and trouble. What's, what's your name? Maureen. Where are you from, Maureen? Gavin. Hey, we love Gavin, right? <laughs> Ivan, come and pray for Maureen. Pray for her forearm. There's also somebody in this room tonight. Do you have, you have a real problem with your left eye? A real problem with your left eye. That's you. What's wrong with your left eye? You had a bang. And is it, is, is it hurting or is it sore? You can't see? I can see it, yeah. What's your name? Savannah. Savannah. That's a lovely name, Savannah. Where are you from? Limerick. Ireland. We love the Irish. Ivan, you also have to pray for Savannah. She's got a problem with her eye. There's also somebody in this room tonight. You have a problem with a condition in your stomach, a long-term condition. It's so serious, they've even talked about removing your stomach. Where is that person? God wants to heal you tonight so that you know the supernatural power of God. There's a lady in this room tonight. You are fearful that you've discovered a lump in your breast. 
and you're just wondering what you're going to do about it. But God is in this room tonight. God is an amazing, amazing God, and he wants to heal people. And whatever your challenge is, he loves you. What's your name? Colin. It's lovely to see you, Colin. Where are you from? Bamford. Battlefield, just around the corner. It's great to see you, Colin. So your mum's been coming here, and you've now come and given your life to Jesus. That's amazing. That is amazing. Ain't God good? God loves you guys. Come on, point your hands towards them. Lord, we just thank you for the people who are coming to know you here and others watching tonight. We just pray great grace on them. We thank you that you love them, that you promised you'd never leave them. Just take them on into every good thing you've got for them. Father, we pray that you'll fill people with the Holy Spirit tonight. We take that word to heart that we've heard. Lord, we want to put Jesus in the shop window. We want, to, we want this world to see. We want to make him famous in this city and the other cities where we live. We want to thank you that you want to give us power. Jesus, we're hungry, thirsty. You promise you'd pour floods on the dry ground. We bless you for the great things that you're doing tonight. Lord, we thank you for Brian and for Betty, for all that they are, all that they do, and we pray great grace, great blessing upon them, that the years that are ahead are far better even than what's been. More adventures, Lord, more breakthroughs, more growth, more success. We pray your blessing on their children and their grandchildren, the church that they're a part of. Lord, we want to thank you for your love tonight. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's hear it for him. Responded to the appeal today, we'd love to hear from you. That's a fantastic decision you've made. Simply contact us through social media or email prayingforyou at destiny-church.com. If you have a prayer request also, just send it in. The team will be praying for you. We we'll look forward to having you join us next week at 5.30 p.m. UK time. Until then, for more information, visit destinyglasgow.com.